Our scripture reading uh, with a view to the sermon this evening will be from John chapter 1. So let's open our Bibles to John chapter 1. It's a fairly unusual text to turn to for a Christmas service, but it's not an inappropriate one. So John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 18, we tend to look at the passages speaking about the birth of Christ and his earthly, earthly birth. But uh, the gospel writer, John the gospel writer, writes for, for us from a different perspective. He tells us that Christ is the man from heaven, God incarnate. And so we have to bring in that view. So let's read John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 18 together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is talking about John the Baptist. So verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. As we come to open up this text this evening, our focus will be on verse 14, and the Word became flesh. We have learned in the first opening verses of this Gospel of John who the Word is. Let's just read it together and open up some of these truths. In verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning, if you read Genesis and you read in the beginning God, the Word is co-equal coexistent with the Father. And so, in the beginning was the Word. Just as God was there before creation, so was the Word with God. And you'll notice the Word there, even in our ESV, is printed with a capital letter. It's telling us of a person. It's not speaking about words you find in a dictionary. It's talking about a person whose name is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was a person who was intimate with God from the beginning of creation. And the Word was God. This Word who was with God is also distinct from God. He was with God, but He is God Himself. This person we read of is none other than the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is called here the Word. Verse 2 then says, He was in the beginning with God. As if to remind us, if we didn't catch it the first time, we have to ponder that again. We have to ponder that truth again. And so John the Gospel writer repeats, but he deepens our understanding. He was in the beginning with God. If you miss that the word is a person, he uses the pronoun here, he. He was in the beginning with God. Just so you remember this person 
was in existence before anything else came into existence. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If you can think of anything that was created, you cannot think of that one thing apart from it being created in Christ. You have to bring all things that were created in relation to understanding it as being created by God through Christ. So everything exists for him and to him and through him, as some of the apostles put it in their writings. Now, in this word, in this person, verse 4 tells us, in him was life. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. This life that God had breathed into man when he created man from the dust, this life, the source of life, came from Christ at the very creation. This is what this verse tells us. The light, the life in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And verse 5 tells us, then, this light shines in darkness. When did the darkness come? You see, the darkness came in Genesis 3 with the fall of mankind. We are all in sin and in sin did our mother conceive us, as David says in the psalm. But here the wonderful truth of the gospel is that the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Paul even highlights for us, as he writes in the letter to the Corinthians, that there is a correlation between the creation, the light of creation, when God said, let there be light, and when Paul refers to the gospel that is preached, he said, God had said, let there be light. Let there be gospel light. Let the message of Christ break into this world. Let it come into this creation. And so this is what we must think of. God, who is the creator, who is above all things, who is above his creation, coming into this very creation that he has made why would God do that why would God do that perhaps some of you would say well John 3 16 you know the verse John 3 16 tells us why would God do such a thing for God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ is God's gift to the world isn't that the greatest gift that we celebrate at Christmas time you know that uh, at Christmas time we wrap the presents and we give presents to one another, but it's to remind ourselves we have received the greatest gift of all. This person, Jesus Christ, who was born. This gift that God has given to the world. But I would propose that many people think of John chapter 3 and verse 16 disconnected from the context of the gospel that this message is found in. Some people turn this kind of love that God loves us with as a sentimental kind of love. God thinks fondly of humans. He loves us. And He would do anything for us. I mean, He gave us His only Son. But then we should not fail to recognize, we've just read, we've just read verse 9 of John 1. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. God sent His Son. He loves the world. He's coming into the world. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. God loves a world that is ignorant of Him. We should know the state of the world. The world is not a place that is naturally inclined to elicit the love of God. It's a place where people are hostile to God and hostile to the things of God or ignorant. We couldn't care what God does. I call him the man upstairs, busy with whatever he wants to be busy with. And he's not much to do with us. And so they often quote, people often quote, for God so loved the world when they speak to Christians. Shouldn't you be loving people? You should understand the love of God. And yes, that's right. We should understand these things, but we should understand them in the context that God speaks of His love. Notice in John chapter 3, verse 35, 
If you just glance at John 3, verse 35, there we also read of God's love. But here we read of the Father who loves the Son. Verse 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So let's tie these three verses together. The first one, John 1 verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and, got, and dwelt among us. God the Creator came in the likeness of of sinful flesh. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, came in the likeness of sinful flesh so that God the Father may condemn sin in the flesh, so that He may remove the condemnation that is meant for us, us who are deserving of hell, to remove that from us. And so, it requires that He gives His Son the Word, He Himself, God himself has come in the flesh. And I don't know if you've ever pondered this, but look at your own hands. Look at, just feel your own flesh and think for a moment. God, who is a spirit, came in the likeness of this very flesh and died on a cross, bearing my sin and guilt. And that very Son of God who died in that flesh rose from the dead, is still clothed in that very same flesh that he died on that cross with. Glorified, yes, glorified flesh. And he is now seated at the right hand of God. He ascended into heaven in that very same flesh. And he represents us to God. And he will eternally remain the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Eternally ever representing us before the Father. And so this is the miracle then of the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God did not somehow remain in heaven and work out a plan of salvation where He's far removed, the man upstairs, working everything in this world. We often pray in terms like that. We especially pray like that in terms of God needing to solve all the world's problems out there. We are quick to pray and ask the Lord, Oh Lord, haven't you seen on the news? Oh Lord, haven't you heard? So and so is in the hospital. Oh Lord, haven't you heard? This is the diagnosis. And if that's not, if that's not insulting enough, we even prescribe to God what to do. Oh Lord, if you haven't seen what's happening on the news, I want to inform you, this is the plan. You need to do something. You need to do this. You must. But you see, what God shows us here is He's not someone who's sitting far removed, whom we need to push and push and push until He does something about external things in this world. He is a God who sends His Son. Jesus did not stay in heaven. He got up. And he did something. He became incarnate. He moved from heaven to earth. You see, there would be no way for us, there would be no access to heaven for us if God had not first made access from heaven to earth. There would be no way from earth to heaven if God had not come from heaven to earth. And this is what John 1 verse 14 tells us, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And this truth where God dwells among us was not a truth all that unknown to God's people. This is what's so striking. Jesus Christ came to his own people and we often think, well, they weren't prepared. He, 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 he came and didn't meet any of the expectations. But it's not as if God had not communicated that He's willing to dwell with His people. If we look at that word, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word there is tabernacled. 
corresponding to the word we get in the Old Testament for God making a sanctuary, making a tabernacle with His people. Now, if we just look at broadly the Old Testament, when God comes to live with His people, the principle that He taught His people when He said, make a sanctuary for me, take a contribution in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8 where he said, take a contribution that they build me a sanctuary. And then God gave all the regulations and he told them how to behave. What were the regulations for the high priest? What were the regulations for these priests and the people and how the camp should be arranged? What God was teaching his people, if I come to dwell in your midst, God says, I am Lord. I rule every aspect of your life. All of your life belongs to me. Your whole life is organized around this principle of God dwelling in your midst. Because the moment you say, oh, that's not comfortable, oh, that doesn't suit me, or I don't like this, who's Lord? Who's in control? Who's in charge? Who's setting the tone for your life? And you see, God did not give His only Son in this capacity to be trampled underfoot by every person in this world. He didn't give His Son so that the world may mock and scoff at Him and trample Him underfoot. Those who mock and scoff at the Son have the wrath of God remaining upon them. He gave His Son, yes, as a gift but as a gift to be received with faith and fear and reverence and respect. To compare this as an illustration, if your parents would get you, get you a gift and they would get you a cheap little trinket which you don't really want, then it's one thing if you toss it in the bin and say, oh, this thing's worthless. But if your parents made you something very special, I saw your kids having a nice bag, made by mom. If you treated those bags made by mom in a way you throw them in the dirt, that would show that you really don't appreciate the gift. Do we really appreciate the gift that God has given us in Christ Jesus, our Lord who became incarnate? Now let's ponder for a moment these other two verses, John 3 verse 16 and John 3 verse 35. John 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. Notice the relationship here. It's the relationship between God and an ignorant world. What should God do with an ignorant world plummeted into darkness, cursed by the fall? The world should remain under the wrath of God. We all deserve hell. We all deserve eternal punishment for our sins. But yet God does not bring that judgment so swiftly. He gives His only Son. He gives sinners a way out. He sends His Son on a rescue mission to save lost souls. And so whoever then believes in Him, who believes in the Son, should not perish but have eternal life. Notice, God loves the world that He gave His only Son. God and the world, God and His Son. And that's where John 3 verse 35 gives us the fullness of this picture. The Father loves the Son. These are words of John the Baptist who tells this to his own disciples. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. When you hear the phrase, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, you may ask the question, well, why would God give his son? Doesn't he love his son? Why would he let his son come to this world and suffer and die on a cross? Why? And then we find out, well, God does love his son. And it's precisely because God loves his son that he has given all things into the hand of his son. And therefore, you know, that the Father didn't send the Son to die on the cross because the Father hates the Son and wishes Him to suffer. 
But he's given all things to the Son in order that the Son should redeem all things so that all things may belong to him and may belong to the Father. Because what is the Father's is the Son's and what is the Son's is the Father's. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. You notice there the word giving. The gift to the world is his son, and the gift to the son is all things. All things. This all things that was given to Christ is reflected when Jesus speaks at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The Father was pleased to give me all things. All authority in heaven and on earth is mine. There is nothing that the Father would not give to his own Son. Notice this in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, chapter 13, just go to verse 2 of chapter 13. This was in the upper room when Jesus was gathered with his disciples and they have this intimate time together. So during the supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Just pause for a moment. Jesus, knowing that the Father has put all things into his hand, what do you think comes next? What would you expect to come next? Jesus took the crown, put it on his head, and started ruling the world. He's, he knows the Father has given all things into his hands, verse 3. And that he had come from God and was going back to God. Verse 4 tells us he rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Just glance down at verse 12. Jesus was demonstrating to them. He was demonstrating to them his mission. Verse 12, he tells this to his disciples. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am teacher and Lord. You call me teacher and Lord. From your mouth, you say, Lord Jesus, you say, teacher Jesus, you say, rabbi. Many people say, Lord, Lord. Many people say, rabbi. Many people say, teacher. But listen to what Jesus tells his disciples, verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, if I did this, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You also ought to wa wash one another's feet. You see, when God gives his son to the world, his son brings the disciples in on that mission so that we as the people of God also become in one sense the gift of God to this world. But are we truly behaving as God's gift to this world? You see, there's a difference in understanding it in a biblical way where God tells us, you are my gift to this world and where everyone goes around thinking, I am God's gift to mankind. You get those people as well. You pat themselves on the shoulder and think they're everything. But you see, the only way in which it's meaningfully understood is if we are in Christ. If we are united to Him. And so, if we are united to Christ, we share in His own mission. And then the lament comes, why, oh why are there so many Christians who don't understand this truth? That you are saved for service. That you are saved to be a kingdom of priests. 
that you're saved so that you may minister to a dying world. That you are saved in order to shine the light of Christ. That you are saved in order to follow in your Lord's footsteps. But so many of us are just talking. Lord, teacher, rabbi, we would never say anything. Nothing from our lips would pass that would ever give the idea that we hate Christ, that we hate God, or that we hate His message or His gospel. But even though no hateful word may come from your mouth, the way that you live, the way that you respond to the instruction of the Lord, will tell you whether or not He is your Lord or not. Jesus Himself tells a parable of two sons, the one son saying, Yes, Father, I will do. And another one saying, No, Father, I will not. And you'll be surprised to find it's the one who said, No, Father, but still went and did. But the son who said, Yes, yes, and didn't do, God is not pleased with such service. Now, we must marvel and glorify God for this verse. The Father loves the Son. For if we do not understand the Father's love for Jesus Christ, if we do not understand the Father's love for His own Son, how, oh, how will we understand the Father's love for us? Because it's only through Jesus Christ, it's only through Jesus Christ that the God who loved this world becomes our Father. You see, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. The Father loves the Son. Whoever believes in the Son, and we've read it in chapter 1 now, all who did receive Him, verse 12, who believed in His name, who believed in the name of the Son whom God gave, God also gave the right to them who believe to become children of God. It's they who receive the right to become children of God. You cannot understand God loves me apart from God loves His Son. Now, if this is true, that God loves His Son and has given all things into His hand, we have further words by Paul the Apostle in Romans 8 verse 32 who tells us of God's love for us. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Notice these two words. With Him. With Him. Dear brother and sister, far too often in our day and age, this world is teaching us to desire the blessings of God apart from God. We want the blessings of God without God. We want a good life without God. We want heaven without God. Legalists want God's law without God. Antinomians don't want God and they don't want His law. But you see, the big problem with all of us, no matter which camp, which controversy, on which side you're on, what extremes you take, the biggest problem with man, no matter what camp, what controversy, what side of a debate you're on, the biggest problem with us is we don't want God. The biggest problem in the world is not that the world is divided between liberal and conservative Or other things. People who baptize babies and who don't baptize babies. The biggest problem is that we want the things of God without God. But the scriptures are clear on this. The Father has given all things to Christ. And all things belong to us who belong to Christ with Him. With Him, with Him, with Him. Jesus told a parable about the owner of a vineyard who leased that vineyard out to tenants. And in Matthew 21, verse 38, 
The tenants became jealous of the inheritance of the son and they want the inheritance without the son. When the tenants saw the son of the vineyard owner, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. That heart that wants to kill the son and have his inheritance is one of our deepest sins when we wish to have the inheritance and the things of God without God. Then we treat the death of Christ our Savior as somehow securing the inheritance for ourselves. People often do this when they say things like, oh, I'm going to commit this sin anyway, God will forgive me. I'm going to commit this sin anyway, God will forgive me. What a terrible sin of presumption. What a terrible sin of presumption, presuming upon the grace of God. God did not spare His own Son, but He gave Him up for us all. How will He not also with Him, with Him graciously give us all things? There is no inheritance for us apart from Jesus Christ. This is the message then of Christmas of thinking about the incarnation of Christ. So many of us sing about the baby in the manger. But as I said this morning, with the words of John the Baptist in chapter 3, where he says in John 3, I rejoice as the friend of the bridegroom at the bridegroom's voice. Are you rejoicing that God speaks through His Son? He didn't just give His Son to be a baby, goo goo going in a crib. He gave His Son so that His Son, as we've read in Isaiah 9, may be called Wonderful, Counselor, Merciful, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. To the extent of His government, there'll be no end. His kingdom is coming. Repent, for His kingdom is coming. And we who have repented and know that His kingdom is coming for us, I have to say this because in this last couple of years there's been wave after wave after wave of panic because the world is ending, the world is ending, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Shouldn't bring panic to us as Christians. Don't be anxious. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Obey the voice of the bridegroom. Because listen to the words of John 3, verse 35, and see the connection between verse 16 of John 3. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 35 says, The Father loves the Son, has given all things into His hand. Verse 36 reads, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. If you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. But listen to what's the opposite of that. Whoever does not obey the Son. You would expect to hear there, whoever does not believe in the Son. These two things are synonyms. To believe in Christ is to obey Him. To not believe Christ is not to obey Him. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son, in other words, does not believe in the Son, shall not see life. You see, we tend to separate faith and obedience and think it's two separate things. Show me your faith without obedience. It's impossible. You don't have faith if you don't obey. It's not a true faith if you're not obedient. But you see, whenever obedience is brought up, what's the objection? Legalism. You're legalist. And what did I say? What's the response to that? It's only legalism if we forget God. It's only legalism if we have the law of God without God. Whenever the law of God is read, we are supposed to think and meditate on the character of God. Who would give such a law? 
And why would he give this particular law? The laws that God give reflect his good character. The law teaches us about who God is. And so through obedience, we get to know the character of our God. Because we obey the good commandments that the lawgiver gives. If Christ is Lord, we will obey him. But you see, we love to be Lord of our own life. But that would be to miss the whole message of Christmas. That would be to miss the whole message of this great gift of God that we can submit to the God who created us, to the God who redeemed us in Christ Jesus, to the God who gives us of the Holy Spirit. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Don't let Christmas become a time of Christlessness. Christ is the center, not only of Christmas, but of every day of the rest of the year. May the Lord help us then. And I know that some of us here may resolve then already, and it's good to resolve and to think about these things and to pray. If we resolve in our hearts, I need to give myself more to holiness and sanctification. Let me encourage you in that. If you take that resolve this evening, don't resolve this in your own power. By the grace of God, may I, by the grace of God, may I grow in holiness. By the grace of God, may I grow in sanctification. Lord, pour out your spirit upon me. And then receive this promise of Jesus himself. John chapter 7, if you'll page there, this is the final promise. But I must give it to you. It's so important. <clears throat> Verse 38 of John 7. Again that phrase, and you find it repeated all throughout the gospel, whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes, Jesus saying this time in verse 38, whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. When God gives the spirit to us, he is not like the Scrooge, who gives us only a little bit and is greedy. But God is the bottomless pit, the fountainhead, who gives the Spirit, who gives the Spirit. And God is more ready to give the Holy Spirit than we are to receive the Holy Spirit. Why is the Spirit of God not more evident in the world around us? It's not because God is unwilling to pour out His Spirit. It is because we are so unwilling to receive but to those who receive, to those who believe, out of his heart. Brother and sister, if you truly believe this, out of your heart, because of the Holy Spirit, will flow rivers of living water. Oh Lord, where will I find the grace to deal with this difficult relationship? Oh Lord, where will I find the grace to deal with this resistance in my marriage? Oh Lord, where will I find grace to deal with this resistance with my siblings? Lord, where will I find the grace to deal? You'll find that grace with God. And God puts this with the Spirit within you, and your heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What Jesus was not yet glorified, but when he was glorified, when he was lifted up on the cross, it's, a, it's an irony that God is most glorified in the cross of Christ, where his son dies on that cross. But do you know where the cross of Christ leads? Hebrews 12. He who did not shun the shame of the cross, but endured became exalted, seated at the right hand of God to receive this kingdom, to receive all things from the Father. 
And because Jesus was glorified, seated at the Father, He told His disciples, I go to the Father, and then He will send the Holy Spirit. I go to the Father, and I will ask Him, and He will give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming from both the Father who loves the Son and loves the world, and from the Son who loves His disciples, who loves His bride. The Holy Spirit then, God's gift to His people. And God never runs out. Let's pray. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank You that we could hear clearly the truth of the words of Jesus when He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. And we know that no one comes to the Father except through You because the Father loves the Son. And He's given all things into the hand of the Son. And so, Lord, as all things belong to Christ the Lord, Christ our Lord, we know that we receive nothing if it's not given to us from heaven. And so we thank you that our Lord Jesus ascended into heaven and that he gives gifts to men. O oh Lord, we pray that we would receive the Holy Spirit and in receiving the Holy Spirit, that we would serve as priests, that we would serve as your children. And, O oh Lord, the sacrifice that you require of us as the kingdom of priests is the acceptable sacrifice, a holy life, a life lived before our God. Be holy as I am holy, a life of obedience and faith. O oh Lord, may you give us the grace through the Holy Spirit to stand firm in the faith, to build upon the rock of the words of Christ, as he has said that the one who hears his words and does them will be likened to a wise man who builds upon a rock. But he who hears and does not do them will be likened to the fool who builds on the sand. And, O oh Lord, we are seeing how you are shaking this world, even as we have seen in this past year, how you have shaken the world by various trials, by wars, by pestilence. And how people are panicking because their houses are falling apart. And, O oh Lord, we know it is as a result of them not listening to the word of Christ and not building upon the rock. And, O oh Lord, give us courage then to declare to this world to build upon the rock. But give us courage to do so in a way not to say with our words, not to be self-righteous and saying, well, I built on the rock. But to declare this in a faithful way by quietly building our own life on the rock of obedience to the word of Christ so that people may see the good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And, O oh Father, we give all of this, our life, our life of faith, our resolves, we give them into your hand and pray, O oh Lord, that you may help us to keep our resolve and our commitment to repentance and growing in holiness. For, O oh Lord, if it was up to us to sanctify ourselves, to make ourselves holy, we have severed ourselves from the source of holiness itself and we'll never reach the goal. But may we come to the fountain. May we come to our God who is holy, who tells us, Be holy as I am holy. Let us not get stuck with the be holy, but let us ponder as I am holy. O oh Lord, help us, forgive us our sin, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.